favorite, favorite thing is my nickname because I was three guys. And I can never remember their names. Tab, tab, shab, dab, or whatever. I didn't call them Tab Red and Tab. Doesn't change the story at all. Yeah. Hey, can you leave that one Amazon slide back up for me? Thanks. Well, good morning, Jubilee Shores. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Whether you are here in person, watching us now via live stream, or perhaps later on as, as your day provides. Welcome in the name of Jesus Christ as we gather for one purpose, to worship our Lord and Savior, offering up our thanks, our praise, our concerns, our joys, and everything during this time of worship. Um, just a couple of really quick announcements. First, um, thanks to everybody who was involved in yesterday's service for Stacy Forbes. I'm not sure if there were so many folks here. I'm not even sure I got a chance. I know I didn't get to meet everybody, but if you were here and I missed you, I apologize. Um, or you may have watched us on Facebook, but it was standing room only. And um, I will say this as the pastor with great humility, probably the best service of its kind that I have ever seen. It was, everybody did a great job. The sound booth, the music was wonderful. Great crowd. Laughing, crying. So just thank you for coming. And keep the Forbes family in your prayers as they continue to struggle through their loss. Um, I asked uh, uh, Morgan to put that slide back up because it amazed me how much the church got from my Amazon buying, which tells me I'm buying too much Amazon. <laughs> but it, it's, it's a no-brainer. You go on, and once you got it set it up once, it's set up. And if you have multiple charities you want to give with, you can always you know, change it for that particular transaction or whatever. But I was amazed that um, over the last year that through Amazon, my small account, which obviously is bigger than I thought it was, um, was over 100 bucks to the church. Free money. Didn't cost me anything. Didn't cost church anything. Just free money. So if we all did that, compound interest, compound monies, just a lot of things. So I invite you, if you have not already, to set up your account for Amazon, Smile, Making Jubilee Shores, your preferred charity, or at least one of them. And if you have any questions about how to do that, please do not ask me. Brittany, Emily, anybody else but, but me. So um, with that, family, I ask you now to cast aside concerns, worries, joys, anything you might have, and just leave it out of this room for this short time together as we gather to hear God's word, to sing God's word, and to listen for God's word today through this glorious service. And because we're finishing up our two-part mini-series, if you will, on Psalm 23, we're going to be using that for our sermon lesson today. We're going to be reading from the New Testament first. We're going to be reading from my favorite book in the New Testament, which is Ephesians. And we're going to be reading from the first chapter, uh, verses 3 through 12. And as you're listening to me read this and as you're reading it yourselves on the screen, notice these are things that have already been done. All we have to do is receive them. This is God being true to his promises. This is God being steadfast. This is why we can have absolute confidence in our God to be with us always, always, always. So I would ask you to rise as you are able, either here or out there in Facebook land, in body or in spirit, as we read from the first chapter of Ephesians 3 through 12. This is Paul writing. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. That's enough right there. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love, he destined us for adoption as his children. Wow. 
through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. Yea, with all wisdom and insight he has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth earth. There is no them. There's only us. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance. It's already there, folks. All we got to do is grab it. Having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. And the family of Jubilee Shores, the word of God for the people of God, Thanks be to God. Now, if you would, please remain standing, clap your hands, stomp your feet, and welcome our worship band and join them in song. Well, good morning, Jubilee Shores United Methodist Church and all you folks out there in Facebook land. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I wish you'd join me in a song of praise.
sings my soul, my Savior God to Well, we got here this morning, and uh, Pastor Dave is, is uh, preaching on uh, the 23rd Psalm, and so I had a, I had a, a, a song picked out about, you know, uh, God being a shepherd, and, and uh, Pastor Dave called an audible, and he said, would you mind playing this song instead? Um, and it goes along with that. We're going to walk by our shepherd. We're going to have a closer walk with thee. A one, two, three. Y'all know this one. Just a closer walk. Sing it with me. I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all. Oh, 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 oh,
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Y'all, yeah, please be seated. Please be seated. Mm. We've been through some challenging times. And I got I to gotta admit, I'm a little mad at God right now. Say I, what? I prayed for an outcome that, that I didn't receive. And uh, I had other stuff this week that, that happened that you know the what Jesus said about you know get the speck out of your eye before you talk about the log in somebody else's eye. Well, that happened to me this week, and I had to I had. I was convicted. I woke up uh, yesterday morning, and and God, pow, clapped me upside the head and said, "Dave, get your ego out of the way. It's not about you." And I said, "Yes, Father, you're right. It's not about me." And in all of this, I am reminded always present, always loving, always with me. He is a good, good father. Thousand stories of one thing. Think you're like I've heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never. Good father, it's who you are. 
As we prepare ourselves to receive the message from Pastor Dave, the spiritual food of God, let us sing and pray together. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you. Thank you, worship band. That was beautiful. Um, before we get into the sermon, there's one last thing I forgot to mention during announcements. Um, normally, I hang out after the service for a little while and talk to people and all that kind of stuff. After this service, I got to leave right away. Um, I have a meeting at 1130 I need to get to. So if you don't see me hanging around, don't take offense. I'm just doing the work of the church. So just so you know. Please join me in prayer. Let the words from my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. This is part two, as I mentioned earlier, part two of this little kind of mini series, if you even want to call it a series, Absolute Confidence in God, looking at uh, it through the lens of Psalm 23. Now, last week we went ahead and we, we went through verses uh, 1 through 4, going in rather uh, detailed explanation of all the natural metaphors that we just aren't familiar with because I don't know any shepherds personally. Um, and, and, but, but those natural metaphors are used throughout the Bible. Jesus uses them all the time to help us give a handhold, to help us understand the supernatural, eternal uh, things, spiritual things, if you will. So understanding those analogies from the, because this was written by a shepherd, this was written by, you know, David, it might help us to know more about what they do. So just a real quick review. The Lord is my shepherd. Remembering that the shepherd only comes for one reason and one reason only, for the sheep's benefit, for us, for our benefit. I shall not want, want being nothing to do with things you desire, but only and solely having to do with things that we need, especially when it comes to spiritual matters. 
He makes me lie down in green pastures. You might recall last week talking about there are four criteria that have to be met for sheep, and for us as well, I would argue, in order for a sheep to lie down. If one of these four is not met, the sheep will not lie down, just will not do it. Those four things were, again, a freedom of fear, a freedom from tension within the flock, a freedom from aggravation, and a freedom from hunger. If those four needs are met, they will lie down and find rest. Kind of like us in lots and lots of ways. Um, he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Talking spiritually, when we drink of, of the water of the Spirit of God, we become restored. But when we drink from other waters, which are always polluted waters, not so much. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. His name's sake. The right paths led and made already for us. It's already been done. Led by Jesus versus the ruts, not the paths, the ruts that we oftentimes tend to follow, our own paths, our own ruts. And what are the right paths again? Love God with all you got. Love your neighbor as yourself. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. As David Webb so wisely said just a few minutes ago, God always present, always protects, always provides, always loves. It's found in Matthew 28. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's forever, y'all. End of the age. Knowing, but more importantly for us, living this absolute truth. That's an absolute truth in the Bible. We can find peace and rest and food, and there's four things needed for us to lie down and rest and have confidence in God, and also the courage to take the next step, whatever that next step might be. Your rod and staff, they comfort me, and we learn the rods. See, I always thought a rod and staff were the same thing. I just thought they were saying, like, you know, stick and twig. I didn't, I don't, I'm not a shepherd, so I don't know. So anyway, but we found out last week that a rod actually is a small club, used for defense for the benefit of the sheep um, and protection of the sheep for the shepherd as well. And then the staff is uh, used more for just kind of herding the sheep and drawing the sheep together and, and just leading the sheep down the right paths. And uh, Philip Keller, who wrote the book that a lot of this came from, who was a shepherd in the sense of a pastor, but also a real-life shepherd, shepherd of sheep. He, he used to own sheep for many, many years. He makes and offers the analogy as, as the rod is the Bible and the staff, which again is used for the benefit of the sheep as well, is a symbol of God's compassion and concern. Today we're going to finish the psalm. We only have two more verses to go. This, this great poem considered by many to be one of the cornerstone parts of the Bible for our faith. And so verse 5 begins, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Sounds pretty simple. But there's so much in that line. So much. It really is, it really is the deepest line of, of that psalm, at least to me. See, first of all, you got to understand is that whole psalm is taking us through a year in the life of a shepherd, in the life of the sheep. The, the first part of the psalm starts out with they're, they're at their home base. And, you know, they, they are in uh, the pastures around the house and, 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 and those issues. But then when we get to verse 4, it says, Though I walk through the darkest valleys, which shepherds around the world have took to mean that going to the summer fields way up high in the mountains as the snow melts. So those are some pretty dark valleys because there's predators and all kinds of other things. So when they get to this, these mountainous pastures, these plateau grazing areas, you know what they're called? They are known by two names, alp lands or table lands. Alp lands or table lands. 
And those grounds, those fertile, fertile grounds are highly sought after by all shepherds. By all shepherds to bring their flocks to, to get really beefed up uh, over the summer for the winter that's ahead. And here's the thing. It says, the verse says, you prepare a table. So, so there's the table, that plateau, using shepherd imagery. The good shepherd, while snow was still on the ground, will make several treks to this table, this plateau, the, these grazing lands. Guess why? For the benefit of the sheep. The shepherd will go up there a couple of months before the summer, you know, trek begins to go up there, and he or she will find the, the, best, and, the best and safest paths to bring the flock to, to get up to those grazing pastures, those tables. Uh, they will also go for, to make sure the ground is free of poisonous weeds and or predators for the benefit of the sheep. They will also bring up sacks of salts and other minerals to put in strategic places once they've done their survey and know where they're going to bring their sheep to so that the sheep can partake in those and get completely enriched and completely you know, fed and full of health and full of life, full of abundant life. And they go up early to clean out the watering holes from twigs and leaves and branches, anything that might hinder the sheep from getting water. They may even put a temporary dam up to hold the water, whatever it might take to provide clean, still waters. See how the whole picture just changes when you can look at it and understand it through the lens of a shepherd? And the good shepherd will spend day upon day, whatever time is needed, going over the ground, plucking out all these poisonous weeds, whatever they may be, getting rid of poisonous plants, making the area safe from predators, whatever it might be. And this is done every year. It's a recurring task. It's not just once and done, set it and forget it. It's every year. This is just part and parcel with being a shepherd to make the pastures as bountiful as possible so the sheep can have abundant life. The parallels to Christianity are just crystal clear, are they not? Like sheep, and especially lambs, um, I found out, don't we often feel, especially in our youth when we're indestructible and our bones still bend and don't break, um, that we have to try everything that comes our way. We have to taste this thing or try this thing, and trying everything just to see what it's like. Oftentimes knowing it's not good for us. Don't we? Don't we do that just like lambs and ewes and sheep? We know it may not be healthy. We know it may possibly even lead to death. I can recall distinctly as a young kid riding my bicycle over this wall at the elementary school. I was whatever you are in the seventh grade. Because I got dared to. No, I got triple dog dared to. And if you get one of those, you got to do it. So I go over this, this wall, and it was, you know, only about, I don't know, four or five feet. And... I land, and I crash. <laughs> Duh. Did I have a helmet on? Oh, no. Who wears helmets? Men don't wear helmets. No pads, no nothing. Somehow, some will, some way, I guess because my bones still bend, I came out of it with just some scrapes and some cuts and bruises. Bike totaled. Came home and faced death possibility number two when I told Dad what had transpired. But we, we do that. We want to try and do and experience everything, even when we know it's not healthy for us. And we try them anyway, just like the sheep. Now, how do we avoid or at least lessen the grief that may be caused from trying these silly things that we try? The grief that comes from doing those silly things, those unhealthy things? We remember. We remember. We remember our God who's there already ahead of us, just like the shepherd in, in the psalm that we're reading, 
and with us in every situation that might be or lead to our undoing. Our Savior knows the perils of darkness, the, the sins of the flesh, if you will. Like sheep, we are at times so stupid. I know I am. And we're always in danger. I'm always in the danger of succumbing to that pool of darkness. Because, folks, let's just face it. I said this before to you. Sin is fun. It, it answers a lot of our cardinal fleshy questions and needs. But it's not healthy and will lead to death. And we know that. Life is made so much easier and safer, more filled with the abundance that he so wants to give us, a, a bountiful life spiritually especially for those who walk closely with Jesus. See, and this is why I wanted David to play that song this morning, because <clears throat> sheep that are wanderers, that are, are roamers, that, that tend to go off by themselves or on the outskirts of the flock, that tend to keep distance from the shepherd, those are the ones that invariably get attacked and mauled by animals. Those are the ones that fall off the cliffs. Those are the ones you get too close to the edge because they want to see and fall over. Hmm. How's it work for you in your life when you've kept Christ at a distance? When the bad times come, is it that much better? When the good times come, it's not quite as good. Being distant from Christ, it's like the sheep who are distant from the shepherd. If we are distant from Christ, we are more likely to succumb to that siren call of darkness. Now, how do we stay close to Christ? You all should be able to recite this back to me because I say it at least one Sunday a month. Got to read scripture. Got to spend time with God. Got to be in prayer. Got to study. That's the answer. Only with absolute confidence in God and God's steadfast promises to us, which we read partially of in those first verses of Ephesians, finding rest and peace in those promises can our Christian life, can our lives be one of calm and quiet confidence of a certitude and give us the courage to keep taking that next step even when life is pounding us down. The Christian walk can thus become more like those mountaintop experiences, the tableland, if you will, green pastures, lush green pastures, simply because we're in the care and protection of Christ, who's already been ahead of us, taking out the poisonous weeds, finding the best path for us. Christ is with us, he's behind us, and he's in front of us, leading the way if we choose to follow, if we choose to follow. I have come so that you may have life, and have it abundantly. We all know that verse. Like shepherds, I can't imagine any greater pleasure that God would take. I, I can't think of one than the pleasure God takes, the pleasure God gets when his flock flourishes in the tablelands that he provides here and now. In his care that God has made possible. I can think of no greater pleasure for God. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Now there, there are two takes on the oil. One is, number one, it's expensive. And so if you can afford to have oil draped over your head, you got some money, you must be doing well, you're good to go. It was what was used to anoint kings. But shepherds have a different reason. 
And it really is mind-boggling. I'm not going to get into the great detail of it. But when they're at the tablelands up in the mountains during the summer months, hordes of mosquitoes and flies and parasites, you name it, it's like bug season down here after, after the rainy season. Well, I'm sorry, up north in New Hampshire at least. Up north in New Hampshire, we've got 12 seasons where I used to live. You know, you got spring, summer, fall, fall, winter, 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 winter. Then you have um, mud season from the snow all melting, followed by mud season, followed by bug season because of all the still water, polluted water from all the snow melting in the mud, on and on and on. It's like that up there. And these flies drive the sheep nuts, especially what's known as nasal flies. They keep buzzing around the sheep, and they're trying to get into the sheep's eyes or up, up the sheep's nose to lay eggs. That drive me nuts, too. I was just a kick, huh? Um, and here, and here, here's, the, here's the thing. To relieve themselves of that aggravation, they'll, they'll do a couple of things, three things, but the two ones that hit me the most were they will go to a tree or a rock or something hard, and they'll bang their head trying to relieve the, ag- the aggravation around them. Ever heard saying about banging your head against a brick wall? That's where it came from. Um, or... They'll run around so much trying to keep, uh, get away from the flies that they'll actually run themselves to death. So guess what shepherds do? I'm not a shepherd. I didn't know either. They each kind of have their own family home remedy that's been worked on for centuries. Um, and it's basically, just think of bug repellent. But it's a thick paste. Oil is one of the main ingredients. And they smear it all over the sheep's head especially around the nose and eyes, and immediately, because it keeps the flies and everything away, there is calmness in the flock. There is calmness in the flock because the flies, they won't go near it, whatever it is. I mean, I wouldn't want to put it on me, but it works. So you anoint my head with oil. So taking both of those understandings about it being wealthy and a way to lower the aggravation, to keep tension out of the flock. I look at it like this. Number one, you're worth the expense of the oil, whatever that is. And number two, by accepting the oil from Christ, annoying things, they'll still annoy you. I mean, you're still going to have family. (laughs) Ha ha. But it's less. It's just less. And now my cup overflows. Keeping in mind the whole psalm leading up to this point. Wouldn't your cup overflow? How could it not? Because you are in the care, the protection, the leadership, the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Wouldn't your cup overflow as well? Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it now? You've been led to green pastures. You can lie down. You're drinking from clean water, still waters. You have the Lord and Savior leading you, and you are following. He anoints you with oil. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Now, to be clear, this does not mean that you're going to be, you know, get a free pass from all of life's pains and hurdles. Jesus didn't. So let us not expect to as well. That's just part of life. It's part of the process. But when those times come, they're less than some. The edge is a little duller. They don't seem to last as long. They don't bring you down as far because of the confidence you have in God. It's always present always protects, always cares for, always loves, always all the good things. God is there. 
throughout the psalm also understand that there's a continuous emphasis, if you didn't pick up on it, about the care and expertise provided by the attentive shepherd, the good shepherd. Not all shepherds are good. Some flocks don't do well. But the good shepherd, their sheeps flourish. We have the best shepherd. It has been stressed throughout the psalm how essential to the welfare of the sheep is the rancher or the shepherd's diligent effort and labor. I mean, just think of what it must be like to go up to these mountaintops every year and get on your hands and knees and hand pick out poisonous weeds and plants, whatever, and make sure the area is cleared of predators and make sure there's plenty of water and it's clean. And all this every year, that's a lot of work. Didn't Jesus do a little bit of work on our behalf as well? I think sometimes we forget the sacrifice that Jesus really did to save us, but to save you some 2,000 years later. The shepherd comes for the flock's benefit. See, I love Jesus because Jesus first loved me. His goodness, mercy, and compassion are made new to me every day. Why? I'm not boasting. I spend time in the Word every day. I pray every day. I study every day. I'm with someone in the church every day, reaffirming those promises that God has made to us, reaffirming the aspects of God's character, always present, always loving, always with us. My trust is in his love for me as his own. I call him master for a reason. I am his. I'm a slave, as Paul writes, to Jesus Christ. My serenity, my peace, my courage has at its basis an implicit and unshakable reliance on Jesus's, the Holy Spirit's, and God's ability to do the right thing for my benefit, to do the right thing for my benefit in any situation, even if it makes no sense to me, because I can't see past tomorrow. I can't see past the next minute. And that, to me, is the su supreme portrait of at least my shepherd. Continually there, always there, flows out to me all this goodness and mercy and grace and love, which come unremittingly. They, ne they never stop. They're always coming. They're always awash around us, showing me and showing you his great heart of love. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. The Greek word house in this translation means family. So, could be read, I dwell in the family of the Lord my whole life long. Could also be read, given what we just talked about, I shall dwell in the care of the Lord forever. There's peace, there's confidence, there's love, there's grace as I dwell in the care of the Lord forever. So family, why spend so much time going over Psalm 23? Why go into such detail why talk about all these metaphors and analogies and, and, and weaving all this together, hopefully? Well, as I said last week, when I started last week's sermon, because of everything that's going on now, I think we needed to be reminded just how much God loves you. We can't fathom it. 
times when we need to be emboldened, assured that our confidence in God is warranted and true. And I am convinced, as David Webb alluded to earlier, that this has been and continues to be just such a time. COVID. We're all over it. And still, it is here. The ongoing and deepening divide in our own country over everything and anything, from the mundane to the serious. Halfway around the world, we have the continued ongoings of Afghanistan and the insurity of what that's going to do to that region once again. And, and, and. So yes, family, I think we could use some reminding. I think we could use some good news. Ephesians is full of good news. Psalm 23 is full of good news. I think you need to hear it. I need to hear just how much, how deeply, how passionately God loves you. And why our absolute confidence in God is warranted. God, who is always present, always protects, always provides, always loves, always warranted. So with that, family, in a moment I'm going to ask you to rise. And we're going to read Psalm 23 in its entirety. And I'm going to ask you to read it along with me. There's something about seeing the words, hearing the words from a different voice, but also hearing the words in your own voice out loud. There's something about that. And and try as best you can to remember the images that we've been discussing these last two Sundays. And my hope is, is that it lifts you, it holds you, it guides you. And you will never look at Psalm 23 the same way again. So if you will, let's put Psalm 23 on the screen, and if you please rise as you are able, either in body or spirit, here or out there, wherever out there might be. Oops, as I lose my page. Check. Ah, here they are. They fell down. And this is a big print Bible. (laughs) Tarn't big enough. All right. Let us begin with reading Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley... I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You announce my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Amen. The word of God for the people of God once again. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. And then we hit upon this a little bit um, just a minute ago about the great sacrifice the, the good shepherd did for our benefit. Communion is a time to remember that, time to receive even more so the grace that God so desperately wants us to receive, to accept, which is totally up to us. It's entirely up to you how much grace you're willing to receive from God. To help with that, let us do the best we can to come before the altar with a clean heart, a cleaner conscience confessing our sins before God and before one another. You need not be a Methodist to come and partake in this sacrament. We normally would have you come up 
and you receive the bread and juice from some serving people, but with COVID, we're back to the sterilized cups. But you may partake. You are welcome to come. The desire of your heart is to know Christ better and to stray from sin as much as possible. You are welcome. Is there anybody who did not get a communion cup when they came in? If you would, just raise your hand, and we will get you one. I think I see a hand up. We'll get you one, too. Here's the invitation. Christ our Lord invites us to, to his table, all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, as brothers and sisters in Christ, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Family, hear the good news. Christ died for us, for our benefit. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. On the night he was betrayed by one of his sheep, he took the bread, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when supper was over, he took the cup, gave you thanks, gave the cup once again to his disciples and said, take, drink, all of you. This is my blood the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you gather in remembrance of me. And so remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we come before you in unity as us, as a family of God, asking that these gifts of bread and wine be made into the body and blood of Christ so that we may be for the world the body of Christ made clean by his blood, all to God's glory. And we come before you, Father, in steadfast confidence of your love, of your always being here, of being behind us, beside us, and in front of us, if we would just follow the paths that you have created for us, making them safe, providing those green pastures and still waters for our soul. And you find this confidence in the prayer that your son taught us as we come together in unison saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is a kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, if you would, just simply remove the clear cellophane on top and put the wafer in your mouth or your partner's mouth and then the tin, pull back the tin for the juice. And I would invite you to stay in your seats and pray for a moment or come and join me at one of the altars up here.
started yesterday's service for Stacy Forbes by just saying, this hurts. I don't know about you, but these times we're in hurts. Hurts my soul. Hurts my mind. Hurts my heart. It just hurts. I have in my life which is shorter than most of yours, I get that. I've never known a time more tumultuous than this. As a country, as a people. We have a God who is always, 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 always with us. Will always lead us to green pastures. Will always provide still water. Will always provide. If not on this world, then the next. Psalm 23 is a cornerstone of that. I hope you make it a practice to read it. I would say every day, but I'm not going to. Let's, let's try once a week, once a month. Let's try once a month. And read it as the affirmation of praise that it is. Having absolute confidence in God's love for you. Absolute confidence in God's steadfast promises he made to us. Why? For our benefit, not God's. Amen. If you would please rise as you are able and let us close this service by singing, Praise God, Praise God, to the tune of Amazing Grace. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Praise God, 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 praise God. Family, go in peace beyond all understanding. First, as always, please help put away some chairs. I got a bolt. Y'all have a great week. God bless.